Well, hi guys, here we are in a very different place in the world than we were a month ago. I mean, I'm sitting at my desk now, so you can see the chaos and the mess. Laurie's in another building across the way with wires going everywhere so we can all talk to each other. Um, and it's a different world, it's a scary world. I hope you're all coping with it. Um, I think everybody's done incredibly well. And before I say anything else, apart from our volunteers who are being brilliant, um, I have to say to the NHS staff in the UK, and I'm sure to all the medical staff throughout the world, they're doing a job beyond all expectations. Hats off to them, claps don't work enough, nothing works enough. We should be so grateful for the, the, the sacrifice actually that they're giving for, for, for us to get us well if we do get this terrible COVID disease. Um, I guess tonight will probably be quite heavily about the coronavirus. I'm happy to take any questions. The answers will be my opinions, not necessarily the opinions of the charity, though I tr will try to temper my opinions down because mine are quite radical, guys, and one day perhaps we can get really radical and have a lot of fun. But it's hard times, it's difficult times. It just shows really, I think, the damage we're doing to our planet, how we've got to change. I just only hope, because this has been so terrible for everybody, I just hope that we do come out of this with a whole new different set of values because if we don't do it, if we don't learn from this, then I think the human race is pretty doomed. But let's not get too morbid too early because I'm sure Laurie's now getting questions battering on. Now, Laurie isn't opposite me. I can't wave at Laurie. Um, he's on a telephone, which I'm listening to in my left ear, um, a long way away. So we hope there's not too much lag. We hope there's not too much problems. And I hope I don't get grotted in all the wires that are going around me to make this happen tonight. So, Laurie, have you got anybody asking any questions at the moment? Uh, there have been a few. Uh, hopefully you can hear me, guys. I am on loudspeaker on Simon's end, so I apologise for any delay. Uh, the vast majority of questions at the moment are about how we're coping with coronavirus and the, the lockdown and the issues that we've got there. Now, luckily, we are, as a veteran practice, we're considered an essential service, uh, but we've had to do quite a lot of adjustments uh, to make it work. Do you want to sort of speak about that for a bit? I can do that for a bit. If you didn't hear Laurie's question then, the question was how are we coping with the coronavirus? Um, we're doing incredibly well. I mean, our volunteers are always outstanding. Um, we are down to a skeleton crew every shift we have now um, because we've sadly told all the over 70s uh, not to come in. I just escaped it by three years, but um, everybody here is pretty mean to me. They've actually, I think they, they were quite clever. They, were, they said you should be isolated, Simon, because we don't want anything to happen to you, thinking that it would keep me out their way for, for weeks ahead now. What they didn't bargain on is instead of me going up there every five minutes or 15 minutes to see what's happening, I'm now on the phone to Alice every 35 seconds to see what's going on, and I have noticed. I can actually now tell. I can make sure she gets an extra grey hair every time I call her. So by the time this is over, she's going to be as white as Santa Claus. So, you know, yes, we're coping well. It's hard. We haven't really started our really busy season yet, which is just beginning to sort of take hold now. We've got over 30 fox cubs, which is quite early for us. We normally have by now maybe six or 10. We've got over 30, so it's an awful lot of work. Um, a lot of volunteers, including one particular volunteer who actually turns out to be Laurie's girlfriend, absolutely giving stalwartly of her time. I think she's going to get grey hairs as well, so Laurie, you're going to be going out with an old woman very soon. Um, but yeah, we are coping, we're doing okay, but I have every admiration for all the people who are helping humans, which at this time we feel a bit sad because we can't help them because we're too busy doing what we do. But everything matters, every animal matters. Um, let's see where we end up, but I think everybody's got to be very careful. They've got to self-isolate. I'm even sitting here with my mask every time I go out, I have to put that on, which seems a bit over the top. But better to be over top and alive than under the top and dead. So there we are. Laurie, give me another question. That's a bit of a hard one to answer because you've got the downside of, of less people outside that much, apart from their daily walks, whatever they're allowed to do, but you have got many more people in this lovely weather. In the UK, it's been beautiful for the last week and likely to be nice for the next week or so. 
um, they're in their gardens seeing things. It's harder for them to bring things in. We thought we'd actually be going out on many more call outs now because people can't officially bring things in to us. So we thought we'd get calls and have to go and collect things. Um, people are still bringing things in. So, but be careful guys, if you're worried, just ring us. Please don't stop ringing us. Don't think we're not here. We are here for you 24 hours a day as always. So are we seeing less? It's very difficult. As I say, orphan season for us is only just beginning now really. It's not really ramped up. Um, it's probably pretty as normal. I know we get, you know, we get a few more weeks in and we go panicking because there's nothing going on and then suddenly it hits the fan and we're absolutely flat out for months and months. So it's probably as is. Every year is slightly different. The weather's been different this winter. We haven't really had a winter per se. It hasn't been that cold. We've had no snow. We've had very few frosts. And, and you know, we were noticed, we had garden birds in, baby garden birds in, and I think it was January or very early February. I mean, ridiculously early. So, you know, we're not, we don't know what to expect as the climate changes, as things happen, the seasons are gonna change and our intake will change, but we're ready for it, we can cope with it. And thanks to Alice's sure hand on the ship, as greyish is going, we'll be there for you all. Give me another one, Laurie. We've got a few people asking, Um, I think every charity will suffer greatly through this, not only wildlife charities, every charity. The estimate from the in the UK is that charitable donations will be down between a minimum 50% and more like 75%. So all charities will suffer, including us. Um, people can't put money in the box, they don't come so often. All, I mean, our open day, for instance, is more than likely to be cancelled. At the moment, we're saying it's cancelled, but we just don't know what's going to happen. We don't know when this lockdown is going to end. So yeah, all charities will suffer. So all your donations, um, all your help would be appreciated. Please spread the word to all your friends to give us a hand. We've noticed that our shop has had more activity lately, so thank you for that. Our Amazon wish list has been helped recently, so thank you for that. But always, I mean, donations, memberships, adoptions are our lifeline. I mean, I know that our trouble is our biggest lifeline, which I know I shouldn't be saying at this time, but is legacies. Any medium-sized charity, any big charity, relies to be honest 85 90 percent on the legacy income um we don't know what's going to happen to that obviously but you know if you if you haven't made your will yet and you're far too young to do that maybe when the time comes just think of wildlife aid because we'd be incredibly grateful um i shall probably be having a bunch of daffodils on my coffin by then but uh, wildlife aid will be ongoing i can assure you give us another one laurie uh, there are a number of people asking in the comments Oh, I really didn't want this question because I don't think it's 100% proven. I, mean, I was been talking to veterinary friends of mine, uh, people who are very high up, especially wildlife vets, whether this is possible. I think, I mean, if you were stroke, if you had COVID-19 and you stroke a dog and then somebody stroked that same dog quite soon afterwards, yes, obviously it's possible you could get it. It is sort of thought um, that, that animals can can carry COVID-19, but they can't give it to us. It's not a subject we're very strong on. We obviously keep our eyes on it all the time. I've got a paper in front of me here that was written today about it. And the advice is, you know, you're not gonna catch it from your animals, but if obviously if somebody strokes your dog or your cat and they have got it and you stroke your dog or your cat, yes, it could happen. So if you're walking your dogs or your pets, you know, just don't, you know, just keep social distancing for not only you, but for your pets as well, and then you're absolutely safe from it, I'm pretty sure. But things could change, you know, it's a very m moving, the you know, goalposts are moving all the time at the moment, so just keep an eye on the news, because I'm sure something will come out. But as far as we know at the moment, if a dog or cat gets COVID-19, or any animal gets COVID-19, they can't pass it to humans. We think the start of this was probably from a, a market in, in Wuhan, um, Again, there'll be lots and lots of, I'm sure, you know, people will be looking at this and investigating this for years ahead. But it just goes to show that we should have the respect for our animals. And if that in fact was the case, I will put one with spanner in the works. I just wonder the effect of, of intensive farming, whether that could also multiply what we're doing. The planet, guys, is giving us, is giving us a warning. It's telling us to respect the planet more, respect our wildlife more. 
and it's telling us just to be careful because you know if this sort of thing does happen and it is passed that way we need to respect if we respect our planet we respect our habitats we respect our wildlife all this would actually go away to a major degree so intensive farming which i've never liked um perhaps we should be looking at that really closely as well that's probably really put a spanner in the works but there we are laurie give us another one so in terms of the current research on that one um the vast majority there's unfortunately there's been a huge spike in people um, Laurie, i'm not sure laurie sorry to interrupt you there i'm not sure people will better hear this i can hear you clearly but i'm not sure you're going to get out to the people um, if Abby says you are, then I, I, will, I will bow to your knowledge. Okay, guys, uh, if you can hear me, uh, please just comment in the chat. Uh, and if not, we'll just try and get Simon to relay everything that I'm talking about at the moment. I can add to my microphone in, but there's going to be some serious delays between the two uh, microphones. Uh, so we'll come back to that one. Um, one of the main questions, have you noticed any uh, changes in behaviour in any of the wildlife that we've seen? I think we we have noticed. So, Laurie's just saying, is there any change in wildlife hey, behaviour? Because obviously, our roads in the UK are, are far less frequented. Um, I mean, it's blissful. I woke up the other morning. I could hear a woodpecker knocking against the tree. I could hear the the pigeons calling, the birds singing, and I didn't actually hear a car. And it was blissful. It's like taking the UK back into the 1950s when the roads were much quieter. And I'm sure people will come back with answers on this later on, that the, the pollution levels have, will really have dropped over the last month. It'd be fascinating to see that because people are now saying that it's the pollution that, 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 that made the COVID-19 worse here. Again, I'm sure there'll be scientists arguing about that for months. Have we noticed more wildlife around? Yes, we have, not hugely. I mean, we're not seeing sort of herds of deer walking up the high street or anything else, but they're getting braver. Um, it, wildlife will always take advantage of what it can. I mean, we can go to Tesco's and buy our food. Uh, wildlife can't do that. It has to take advantage and it will take advantage when it can. And if the roads are quieter and they can feed nearer to the roads or they can come out a bit, which they wouldn't do normally or go into people's gardens because not so many people about, um, then obviously, yes, we are noticing more wildlife. I mean, people's gardens actually are probably getting more, more uh, habituated with people because they're all at home. But we're noticing that wildlife is about on the edges of roads more and obviously we should keep a careful eye of that and whenever we get back to normal whatever normal is um, remember that wildlife will need to to pick up that information so we don't go and run it all over too quickly laurie give us another one uh, so actually we're hearing in the comments uh, that people can hear me at the moment um, oh i'm so sorry if i'm so, i apologize that people can hear laurie so much we hope we might have muted him from you but even though I can't see him to stick my tongue out at him and he can't do that to me, which he often does when I'm talking, um, you've got him, so I'll let him ask the question you can hear it. <laughs> it's just going back to the, the previous topic about whether uh, pets and stuff can carry it. Unfortunately, there has been a, a large spike of people that are giving up cats and dogs to local um, animal shelters, thinking that it's going to increase their risk of uh, catching COVID-19. And the, whilst uh, scientists obviously have not 100% uh, worked out if it can be carried on fur or not, if you're following the correct protocols, you're regularly washing your hands before and after touching an animal, you are washing your hands, you're not touching your face, um, then the current advice is there's no reason to worry about that and certainly there's no reason to um, try and limit um, or give up your animal for that one. Uh, so please just make sure that we all know that one. Um, currently, there's no reason to uh, objectify sort of dogs, cats, anything like that because of this. So the message, guys, is don't panic, don't worry too much. But as I said before, don't let other people stroke your animals, just play safe. So you should really isolate your dogs as much as you, are, or your cats, as much as you isolate you. Um, and that way we will all be safer. So. Don't rush to it. I know a week ago that was going on. Hopefully that's getting a little bit less now, but just be careful. I mean, everybody's always said in this country, we're just saying, I mean, I'd never wash my hands so much. My hands have never been so clean. Wash your hands and just be sensible. Just think before you act, which we should have been doing to this planet for all these many years, which we haven't been. So another lesson we should be learning. Laurie, give us another one. Yeah. My hands are actually falling apart at the moment. They're uh, cracked and dry and everything. So uh, I imagine sales of uh, hand creams are going to go through the roof with all this going on. Um, so, uh, a bit off topic, but how far into the year do frogs spawn in ponds? 
Uh, that's a very different question. Very different question. Not something I'm that strong on, but I do know there's frogs born everywhere and there's toads born everywhere. Um, so that's been going on for some time. Again, spring has sprung much earlier than it seems to have ever done before because of the sort of general ch climate change. Um, I'm sure there's tadpoles around already. Um, I sadly, I keep willing my little fish pond to have frogs born in, but I think if we did have frogs born, the fish would eat it within about three minutes. Um, and we've got some more ponds up the garden, which we use for sort of rehabilitating animals. And they haven't got frogs born in it either because they've got a lot of ducks. So I need to build yet another pond, which is not duck friendly or fish friendly. And maybe we may get um, frogs, toads, newts, all sorts of things. Which I love seeing in a pond. Sadly, we have none of the above. Um, we haven't changed that much. Um, even the people that we've sort of furloughed and said they can't come in because they're elderly and expendable, um, they're still doing rescues. Ron, who's been with us for a million years, um, was very upset when we told him he couldn't come in. Um, we have spoken since and he is speaking to us again, but he's still able to do rescues. We obviously do wear masks and gloves for your sake, for the public's sake. Um, and when we get more calls, it will happen more. If Laurie and I go out, we'll probably go out in separate cars, but we will obviously try and keep our social distancing as much as we can, which will be interesting when we're trying to wrestle a badger to the ground. I'll see what happens with that, what happens. But no, we are still there. We're still working 24 hours a day. Sadly, some of the larger charities have knocked off their, um, their, their evening calls. They're not working from 10 in the, at night until seven in the morning, which I think is a great shame and a pity that they couldn't have found some way of doing it. But um, as far as I know, all the wildlife hospitals are still functioning and doing what they should be doing. And as always, we do our best. We can't promise to be totally there for you, but we, 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 we do everything we can. So, yeah, um, as a couple of you might have seen from some of our videos that have been recorded during um, or just before the lockdown, the most recent one, um, we are obviously wearing masks, we're wearing gloves, we're making sure that the caller who uh, has called it out is actually not on site when we go in so if they have to open up a side gate for us to do that in advance so we can just go straight in deal with the animal either take it away or release it on site and we don't have to have any sort of contact with anyone else uh, if we do need more than one rescue we're trying to limit it just to one at the moment but if we do need more than one we are going in separate vehicles uh, we'll turn up in separate vehicles we'll both be in the full masking gloves as normal and we will keep two meters apart uh, if i have to poke him away with a pole i will try and do that but uh, at the moment, we haven't had to come in with that. The closest we got, we had uh, a starling trapped in an atrium, a 40-foot high glass atrium. Uh, do you remember that one, Simon? I do remember that one. I remember that. So I will continue this cause, because your voice bores me, Laurie, after a while, and it's all I very faint. Everyone. I know you don't, really. Um, Laurie, I know I take the Michael out of Laurie an awful lot, but I mean, without him, I would be absolutely screwed. I would be in such trouble. Uh, but we did go out, we went out in separate cars, we had our masks on, our gloves on, and just as we got there, we'd worked out roughly how we thought we could do the rescue, because I mean, we needed 11 metre poles, it was a very difficult rescue to do, but as we got there, they opened the doors and the starling walked out. Um, so that was the end of that rescue, we came home, and we haven't had another one like that since, but I dare yeah. say they will start to come very soon. Yeah, literally, it was as we pulled into the car park, we saw these automatic doors open, and the bird just walked straight out. It was, you, you couldn't have made it up. I wish, uh, I had a head camera on at the time, but unfortunately there was nothing actually on the doors. We wish we'd have filmed it, that would have been uh, quite funny. But other than that, we've done quite a lot of fox call-outs at the moment. We've got uh, a lot of our volunteers working absolutely around the clock. Um, not, not wanting to name a couple of names, but they know who they are, um, doing absolutely fantastic work going out to foxes, especially lactating vixens at this time of year, and a lot of fox cubs. Now, anyone who follows most of our social media, including YouTube, will realize we currently have 32 admitted into the center. We have just, uh, because that's right up to the limit of what we can uh, deal with in terms of the small animals and the orphan feeders with the skeleton crew that we've got, we have moved a few of those on to other practices, so Vale Wildlife Centre, South Essex, uh, Wildlife Hospital, and RAS, the Wildlife Rescue Ambulance Service, and 
Enfield. A uh, big shout out to them, the coach has a lot taking uh, those cups. But we're still open, uh, we're still taking in everything, and we are churning through cups at a rate of knots, as I'm sure you'd agree. Laurie's the only person I know who can answer a question in five sentences or even 25 when one sentence would do. I, I am nasty to Laurie, but it's even safe for me to be nasty tonight because he's nowhere near me. He could pull my screen out, but oh, I could cut my wire actually, which is just there. That would be quite funny because he'd probably panic. But no, we are there. Laurie's there. Laurie does all the difficult stuff. I just take the glory. I find it works well for me, guys. The thing is, if I pull on the wire that's down here, you can see it raising up in the corner of your screen anyway. I can. It's wiggling now. Laurie, can you stop wiggling my wires? I, I don't like my wires being wiggled. I get very funny about it. Right, give us another question, man. Uh, there are a lot of people actually wishing those well wishes at the moment. We do have uh, a very kind 500 Swedish krona donation from Penella Berg. Uh, and she's put, for the birthday speaker that she now won't have, thank you for all the cute videos with the baby. Um, thank you very much for that. That's incredibly generous. You're... Uh, very welcome. We will try and put up as much content as we can with the Cubs now that we've got them. Obviously, with everything that's going on, we might need to drop um, content down just very, very slightly. But oh, no, we won't, Laurie. No, we won't drop content. You'll just work harder, Laurie. Let's get this square. Uh -huh. I'm sitting here, I'm actually, I'm sitting at my desk. You can see the mess of my desk, which isn't like the one I speak, I do this normally with, but I'm sitting watching a blue tit on our webcams, um, building a nest in one of our nest boxes. So that will go up later on. We've got quite an interesting scenario going on because we've got two nests being built as we speak, but we never see both blue tits in the nest at once. And I can't work out, and Laurie can't work out, but it's the same blue tit building two nests, deciding which one he wants, or whether we actually have got two different blue tits building nests but when one of the nests gets a bit further it's going quite well it's gone well today actually this nest is it's getting up there and um, we will let you know and we will put it live on our web streams we've got fox cubs on our web streams at the moment but we will be swapping things over as the season changes as more stuff comes in and i dare say the blue tip will become one of them can i just say we are absolutely sure that they're separate because one's a blue tip and one's a great tip so unless it sort of has different suits and it's changing each time uh, they are very definitely different birds there's so many comments I could have made to that if this hadn't have been live, Laurie. But you will notice that I refrained from any naughty um, comments that I could have made. It was quite interesting that I managed just to go, hmm. Next question, Laurie. Pass on quickly. There's a lot of people saying stop picking on me. So I, I love him. I do love him, really, guys. I really do love him. I'm only really nasty to people I really like. So just remember that. <laughs> Well, there's a million, a trillion things you could do. I mean, as you know, I, we've talked about it in our last um, webcast, in our last live sessions. We've got this new amazing um, scenario called iDot, which is I do one thing. I'm sure Laurie, as I speak, will be putting up the website address and everything else. It was originally designed to start to go out to schools and then later on it was going to move across to families. But because of uh, COVID-19, we've done a very quick swap round and Abby's been working amazingly hard, sort of changing everything from school activities to family activities. But it's all the thousands of things you can do to help wildlife. If you're in your garden, um, you know, you can look for things that shouldn't be there, rubber bands, all nasty stuff. You can cut holes in your fences for hedgehogs. You can make sure that you put lots of little twigs and have a nice little wild area. You can plant plants that sort of bees and things love and things that you can eat. I mean, there's a million things you can do, but not only have we got lots of suggestions and lots of activities that you can do, but we want to hear from you. We want you to post them because somebody or many people hopefully will come up with ideas that we hadn't thought of and we can share those all around the world. The whole idea, um, just in the UK alone, if everybody did one thing a day, and it can take a minute or a second or 10 minutes, doesn't matter, that would be 24 billion actions a year. Now, we all think that we can't make a difference individually, and no, individually we can't, but if everybody did something and 24 billion things happen, then that will make a massive difference to our wildlife, to our habitat, to places where animals can go and hide or get food. It would be incredible. I mean, we need to build this up. We need it to go. And while you're at home, you can do it as a family. 
Um, I think, you know, I think one of the biggest problems we could have with this lockdown is that people are going to get very tense, they're going to get anxious, they're going to get depressed because there's nothing to do and, you know, people are living in very close proximity to each other, um, which they don't normally do. So, you know, get out in the garden, have a look and email us, tell us what you've been seeing, tell us what you've been doing and give us some new ideas for IDOT that we haven't had before because there must be trillions of things out there that we haven't thought of. And if, this, if you can watch the counter moving up, if I could see that counter get to a million actions this year, that would be a great start. And it can happen. We've got one lovely guy in Wales designing an app for us. Um, he was bullied by his wife, who was watching one of these live feeds, actually. And she said, I think you should do that for nothing for the charity. And But he's cracking away. He's building the app as we speak. So that will be up soon. So you can hopefully download things much quicker to your mobile from your mobile phone. But yeah, IDOT can work, it will work, but again, it takes one, each of us to do it, but the cumulative actions will make it work, and you're spreading the word, telling everybody about it, passing the knowledge on, make IDOT work, it will make Abby very happy, because she has spent countless hours making IDOT what it is today, fine-tuning it, honing it, changing it. I've got emails I'm looking at now all the things that have happened today about IDOT that Abby's making happen and changing so it looks better. Guys, I think I've said IDOT enough now. Please do it. Please help us. Let's go on to another question before I IDOT myself out of the universe. Put it this way, as soon as we mentioned IDOT, Abby and I have a little chat going at the moment so we can sort of chat to each other and pick out the comments uh, as the chat moves forward. And it's just IDOT with four exclamation marks and a smiley face. So she's definitely happy we're talking about it. But I haven't um, said food chain yet, Laurie. No, not yet. That's, that's your either, either, either food chain are the four words you use. I, I, I can show you one of these t-shirts. The other t-shirt I can't show you, but I'm just moving across my desk, making sure I put up the right t-shirt here. Because Laurie, Laurie did this for me a while ago um, because they get so fed up with me saying I dot, I dot, I dot and food chain that they made me this t-shirt. So there it is. Um, that's really what I do talk about. I'm so boring. The other t-shirt I can't show you because it's naughty and I'm not allowed to show naughty things before the watershed. Laurie, give us another question. Moving on. Uh, just on putting back on the subject of IDOT, uh, we do have multiple um, options and ideas on our IDOT website, which Abby has been putting down in the chat. Uh, if you didn't see the Carla Camapodia earlier, it's idot-wax.org.uk and on there uh, we have seven day plans for how to make your garden um, friendly to wildlife, both for families and children, ways to make your, your home more eco-friendly. We've got um, instructions on how to build bird boxes and the sort of right hole size that you need to attract certain types of birds, uh, what size you need to cut uh, a hole wide in your fence to make it easier for hedgehogs. There's a whole load of ideas on there and we will keep posting that over the next few days and weeks. So please do keep uh, an eye on the resources on there and we'll do our best to get as much as possible out. So there you are guys, keep looking, go onto the website, go onto either the WAF website or the IDOT website, we've got two but they interlink to each other. Um, I know it's helping us but it's actually helping the planet hugely and if you can spread the word and get the word out there, it could be like a mushroom growing to this massive movement which would make such a difference. I'll shut up now Laurie, ask me another question. Uh, there's actually one for me on there, which is when did I join WAF? So uh, I've been working here. I've been working here four years in February, just gone. Uh, and then before that, I was a volunteer for probably four more than that, maybe more. I, I've lost count now. Uh, but you can blame my girlfriend for that one. So she started off on that. Uh, White Oak University in Southampton. She invited me up. I started doing the odd shift on my days off, and unfortunately, I'm now padlocked to a desk. So uh, I'm not going anywhere for quite some time. But thank you very much for asking. I've actually got a new piece of kit that if, if Laurie goes more than four miles away from here, he actually explodes. Um, he doesn't know it yet because he's never managed to get four miles away from me. But yet, you know, if he did ever do it, there could be a nasty mess on the roads. And what are we going to do with rescues then if I can't go more than four miles? I'll just retire. <laughs> uh, a couple more uh, donations have come in. So Pavel has donated 100 euros and just put thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, especially at the moment with everything going on. That is hugely important. It was vital to sort of keep our, our fox cubs fed and heated and watered, and especially as we're going to get badger cubs very shortly, and we're just starting to get uh, baby birds in. We had uh, a tiny robin in today that weighed just two grams, so very, very small. Um, Matthias has donated 20 euros, so thank you very much to you. Uh, and Carla donated 20 euros as well. Thank you all so much. That is incredibly important for us, so thank you. Pretty
pretty stunning, really. I mean, is, is Lucy Kells online tonight, Laurie? Is she joining us from Portugal, where she is? It's very funny. I was on the phone to Lucy the other day chatting about something, and you suddenly sort of squeaked and, and said, I'm going now, I'm going, I'll call you back. And she'd actually just seen a baby blue tit fall onto the ground. Um, and then she'd picked it up, and then she got her husband, Sean, who is a brilliant rescuer, um, to go and put it back in the nest. And, and she sent us the footage. I'm sure Laurie, when he gets around to it, will put it up. So she filmed it on her phone, but she sort of in the middle of talking, said, I've got to go, I've got to go, I've got to rescue. So there she is, all the way in Portugal, still carrying out the WAF motto that will be there for them. That footage actually has uh, been passed on to Sean, who's the newest member of our, our media team. He's doing an absolutely fantastic job. A large number of the videos you've been seeing on the channel have been done by Sean from home. So a huge thank you to her. Um, and she is currently editing the footage and will hopefully get that video out very soon. So uh, watch this space on that one. There you are, you've been told. The oracle has spoken from distant, <laughs> distant <laughs> shores. Give us another question. We do. We rescue bats. People are very scared of bats, which is quite a shame because a bat, you know, it, 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 it echolocates so it knows where you are. It's never going to fly into you and, and do any damage. It's going to fly around your room and hide if it can. But we do quite a lot of bat rescues. People are quite scared of them. We go in there and sometimes because they can get a little pipper straw bat and get into a gap that's only half an inch wide. So that's a tiny little gap. So imagine in somebody's room where they could hide behind books, behind curtains everywhere so we often spend a lot of time we have a bat locator I call him Laurie um, but um, it actually does pick up the sound from bats which gives us a bit of a clue as to where they are in the room but we go out for quite a few um, and this time of year obviously we'll be going for more um, they often people are worried about them because they say they go very still and don't move very much it's only because they've got cold uh, they go what we call torpid um, and if you just warm them up before you release them they'll go off quite happily. We try to release bats very close to where they were found because they know their territory, you know, they know their hunting ground, um, so we make sure that we always put bats back where they were found. So yes, lots of those. We've actually had uh, a surprising number of bats, everything from uh, Pipitro, Soprano Pipitro, as we had uh, an Athesius bat as well, a Natura's bat. Um, the vast majority of those actually go to uh, a dedicated bat carer who sort of finalizes um, their rehabilitation process. But we have had an awful lot of those as they come out of hibernation. Um, an awful lot of them get picked up, get knocked off, are, are not particularly uh, happy. So we have been dealing with an awful lot of those over the past couple of weeks. It's a great thing to build. If you can build a little bat box in a, in a tree in your garden, um, you need to build it quite high. But there's lots, if you go onto the web, there's lots of different designs for these things, but they're quite simple. But washing bats flying around at night at dusk is pretty amazing. And when you think that little bat's got to eat, about 3,000 insects a night to get through to the next day. So if you've got a garden pond as well, they just love that because there's lots of mosquitoes and flappy things flying around the ponds. Fascinating things to watch, dead silent, and they will avoid all the obstacles just through echolocation. So pretty stunning creatures. Yeah. Whenever we actually put videos out about bats, we get a lot of comments worried about rabies. Um, and obviously that's a, a big issue in places like America and Africa and other areas like that. But luckily, here in the UK, we actually don't have a major problem with rabies. Uh, and whilst bats potentially have been known to carry rabies, there hasn't been a case of that in a long time. Uh, and anyone on our side that actually deals with bats does have a rabies vaccination and handwear gloves as well. So we're, we're perfectly safe on that regard. But that's why you should never try and handle a bat. Uh, it's just not worth the risk. The only person uh, I know is rabbit is Laurie Braley dangerous man at night. He turns into a werewolf at midnight too. I still have to work for this man. Uh, Lucy's actually suggesting you need an electric shock collar for me. So I'm not entirely convinced that... Uh, that's, a heck, heck of a, I've, that's a heck of an idea, really. I mean, they're really cruel. Don't ever put electric shock collars on your dogs, guys, because they're really nasty things. Um, there are, if you do have to have something to make a dog take notice, there's other things that aren't so violent but I think one for Laurie would be a really good idea. I won't tell you where I would put it because again, we're prior to the eight o'clock watershed. Off you go, Laurie, let's change the subject quickly. He's a very different man on live streams. Um, uh, question, 
how did uh, Alana and I mix or Alana's my girlfriend? Uh, we actually met through photography. We both wide photography. Oh god, through, but yeah. this isn't Love Island people. What's the matter with you I, talking I'm about that? This is uh, this is lo this is not Love Island. If you want the webcam in there, you can do what you want to do. But you know, this I've is never watched Love Island. <laughs> this is about wildlife, guys. Now, perhaps their life might be wild if you think about it. Okay. That could be. Stop. Sorry. Stop. Stop. Off we go. What's the most unusual animal you've rescued? Go. Oh, we have thousands of these. I don't know the most unusual. Probably, if you go into sort of ones that we've done, I've rescued a six-foot python from behind a fridge. I've rescued a dirty great, um, I've even got it what it was now, a gecko type. No, what's the big, what's the big things, Laurie, like lizards, massive lizards? Like monitor lizards, iguanas? Yeah. Iguana, I think it was, about from Iguana. a 40 foot up a pine tree, because nobody would touch it. And this thing's great, but they, what I didn't realise when I first did my very first one, is they have these sort of big spikes down the back of their tail, and when they get hacked off, they flip their tails around. So if it's anywhere near you, it really, really hurts. But anyway, we rescued that, so there's sort of some one-offs. I think I've only done one of each of those, but we've rescued all sorts of things over the years. We've rescued a white plastic bag from the side of the road and we were told it was a swamp. When I wanted the tone lowered, Laurie, of tonight, I would ask you to say that, but here we are. You know, we're trying to be serious here and we're trying to be sensible and professional. And, it you know... on the channel. You if just... you want to have a look, it's, uh, I think it's under the game, but it was a genuine rescue and record out. A down swan by the side of the road that turned out to be a white plastic bag. So luckily it was okay and it did make a full recovery. And it went to Tesco's and got the shopping. <laughs> and moving swiftly on as we do every now and then. A uh, uh, um, couple of people are asking how do you get bats out of the house? Now, interesting, unfortunately you can't. Uh, they are a protected species and if you do have bats roosting in your house, you can't move them. You have to wait for them to go um, naturally. But uh, I think you've got a bit more information about this one, Simon. <laughs> not. Oh, he's such a comedian, Laurie. He's getting more brave. He's only being very brave tonight because I can't get near him. I can't whack him one. Um, not really. Um, we get, if the bats have got into a house when they're not roosting there, they've obviously just come in. Obviously, we can get them out. We can just let them go and they'll go to where they want to go. But if they are roosting, you can't do anything about it, guys. You've got to leave them there. And you should be quite pri privileged, actually, to have bats in your house. I've got quite an old house and we've got very big rafters up in the sit up in the roof. And you can actually see where the, the beams have gone shiny, where the bats have been roosting up there, um, which, is, which is quite fun. So we have a few bats here um, and um, we've got a few batty people here as well, of which Laurie's one of them, certainly. Definitely. Move on, Laurie. Who? Uh, Sven? Never heard of him. Sven. Have we heard of Sven before? <laughs> has, you've heard of Sven. Has Sven obviously... Sven. He's never given us any money before, though. So he's giving us yet another 200 euros, which is huge. That's every single live stream he's given at least that. We should, we should really do a counter. We should, we should start a Sven counter. We'll, st we'll have an IDOC counter and a Sven counter, and we'll see which goes up the furthest. I think Sven might win. He's good lad. Sven, you're a star. Amazing job. So thank you very much to uh, Sven. And he's put, I really hope that Open Day happens. He's already booked his trip, uh, if it is going on. So currently with Open Day, we are still potentially going ahead, but with everything that's happening, it's very likely that that will not happen. Um, as and when that decision is made, we will let people know. Please keep an eye on our website and our social media. Um, we will be holding with every bit of government advice, and if the advice at that uh, time is not to have gatherings of that number of people, then unfortunately that will not be happening. But uh, we'll, see, we'll see what happens with that one. Watch this space, guys, is the only thing I can say on that. Watch this space. Uh, did you ever have an animal? Uh, did you ever have a rescue with an animal that recovered but wasn't able to be released for some reason? Um. I'm trying to think back now because there's a lot of cases when we get and we hear stories from other places that you know they got this baby animal in and sadly it became imprinted or became humanized and we couldn't release it so we had to keep it as a pet. To my knowledge there is no animal or bird that we've had here that we couldn't release. I do not believe that things become imprinted unless people imprint them unless people humanize them. So if you do, if a wildlife hospital does its job correctly 
it just will not happen. You can get anything back to the wild. If we get something that can't go back to the wild for other reasons, then obviously, as we say, we do euthanize. I believe wild animals should be in the wild, and if they can't survive in the wild, if they just get predated very quickly, we don't release them, we actually euthanize them. I do not believe in a wild animal in captivity. It's never necessary. Um, we can get them back and we can get we've had animals brought into us before which have even been adult which have been very imprinted with a bit of work we can get them back to the wild and that's exactly what we do here endeth today's lesson guys uh, another donation again from a scottish astronomer who is once again a regular uh, watcher and donator to this channel so that's 25 pounds thank you very uh, much good luck with all the season rescue is definitely harder than rocket science i've never been attacked by a rocket or walloped by a spacecraft i really hope you're not uh, because they tend to weigh a lot more than a swan <laughs> laurie does that mean that i can show them my other t-shirt now no okay no. but it, it does include the words rocket science yeah so, so basically it says it's not rocket science i think we should have a competition if if somebody can guess exactly what's on that t-shirt I will personally autograph a copy of my book and send it to you. First person who guesses correctly will get an auto, a signed copy of my book because um, it's, not, it's not rocket science, but there's a few more words that aren't included um, in that sentence. So, Laurie. Moving on. <laughs> swiftly uh, on. Nathaniel has asked, uh, in the terrapin basking and stone by his local river, should that be reported? Um, I'm not actually sure. Um, Laurie or Abby or Alice can uh, probably do a quick Google. I'm not sure whether you have to report them. They're certainly, they're, they're not native. Um, they, they do a lot of damage to our natural wildlife here. But there's just so many of them. I don't think we could ever get them totally under control now. There's you know tiny little terrapins to the big terrapins. And they love basking on rocks in the middle of ponds. Um, they, they've got their own little personalities. You wouldn't like them too much if one of them got you because they really hurt w w when they do bite at you. I was in Florida once and we had a, a snapping turtle, which I didn't quite realise the significance of until it turned its neck round through more, more degrees and a further distance than I thought and nearly bit somebody's finger off. They're really quite vicious. So if you do see a bigger type terrapin, I would suggest you don't try and handle it. Whether you have to report it, I'm sure Alice or somebody will be hot on the line answering the question at the moment. I don't think you have to, but it would be an idea, possibly. The, the thing with uh, terrapins is because they are considered a non-native species, if found and caught, they do legally have to be euthanized. Um, so unfortunately, there's no relocation that can be done with any of those. Uh, legally, if you catch a terrapin, it has to be put down. Um, in terms of should you report it, the government are quite keen if you do see one to report it, but obviously it depends entirely on whether the animal is captive or not. They're not going to be sort of draining rivers to try and find them or anything like that. So uh, that one is entirely up to you. Laurie is my own little Encyclopedia Britannica, and um, he's very annoying because he does know the answer to most things, but it's also That's quite useful. Also not true. Because when somebody asks me, Do you know the answer to the question? I said, No, I don't. But my colleague Laurie does, and off he'll go. He'll parrot away for hours with an answer that I just way beyond my my knowledge. Laurie, give us another wildlife question. Most people are actually guessing. Uh, uh, that's later on. We'll, let's not go there now. Let's just whoever wins it will get a copy of my book. Um, we'll tell you. How can we tell them who they are, Laurie? Do they have to give us their email address? They will. We have to decide on a winner, uh, and then said person will have to uh, give us a contact. But how can we get that if we don't know who the winner is yet? Well, it depends. So in terms of people who have guessed it right already, uh, so the first person was Nathaniel L. Uh, and then Daniel Renard guessed right second. Uh, Scottish astronomer guessed right third. Do they guess it exactly uh, right, Laurie, if you follow my logic well, without giving the game away? Do they get it exactly they, right as per the wording on the T-shirt with the, with the other missing things? Ah, it's got to be right, guys. Right. It's, it's got a, only one person that's got it right at the moment, and that is Scottish astronomer. So Scottish astronomer, send us your email address, guy, and we, I will, with pleasure, send you a copy of my book, which is, yes, I'm not even going to go there, actually, right? Yeah. So we leave it at that. So Scottish astronomer, you've got yourself a book. Give us, give us your email address. In fact, as you know now that you have got it right, 
send us your postal address and we'll get a copy off to you. That is a promise. I wouldn't do that in the chat just in case you get something that's not a book. Um, but if you can send us an email to media, M-E-D-I-A, at wildlifeaid.org.uk, uh, Abby Wright will sort that and we'll, uh, we'll work with you. So uh, please drop us an email on that one. And if there are any problems, um, just drop us a message and we'll try and sort it. Laurie, I'm feeling particularly generous tonight. So one person's got it right already. But if yep. the, the, the 47th person who gets it right following that correct answer, we'll also get a book. The 47th person after that one. So give us your, de- give us your email addresses. 47 people. Yeah, 47 people. They'll get it right. They're not stupid, Laurie. I'm wondering what I did to deserve this. I just want to make a little bit of work for you. We've got to work out what the 47th is now. That'd be quite fun for you, Laurie, or Abby, or somebody. Off you go, guys. Give us another question meantime. Yeah, I think I have. I mean, we would send something to go to a, a better place temporarily. If we get lots of uh, signets in and they need to be with other signets, we'll send it to a sanctuary, but only temporarily so it grows up with other signets before it goes off to the wild. But we wouldn't put anything long term in a sanctuary. And I don't think we ever have, to be honest. I might uh, be corrected no, on yeah. that, but I don't think so. It's the, the ethos of the charity that we have at the moment is that every wild animal needs to stay in the wild. So uh, we don't keep animals in captivity or anything like that. So um, we have seen um, foxes and things like that. They go absolutely mad, but even if only held in a pen for a couple of days, that's very unfair to make them do that for a longer term. Uh, so we do put every animal back that we possibly can. I mean, the only animals we have kept that have been wild, and when I think about it now, it, it, is Alice when she gets really wild we do have to pen her up and you of course Laurie I mean you know but you can only go four miles before you know what happens to you if you go more than four miles away it all goes off excellent I love it I, we will be videoing this guys so if Laurie does look like he's going to be killed there will be a video camera on the action at all times Thank give us another question Toby. So yes, we do have pets because Toby is one of them. Toby is now five and a half months old. He's very lovely. He was going out. With, he does. He walks in the river now. He won't quite swim in the river. I will try and get you some footage, guys, because he is quite cute. Um, he puts his feet in the water. Um, so we've got Toby. We've got a rescue golden retriever who's two, two and a half, three years old. We think we don't know any of the history. But he was absolutely gorgeous. When he came here, he was so scared. You only had to lift your arm above your sort of waist and he hit the deck. So he'd obviously been quite badly treated before he came here. He's 99% better now. Um, and he's another golden retriever. And Toby and he get on like a house on fire. I will get you, I'll get, give some footage to Laurie of them playing in the garden because they absolutely brilliant together. And of course, we've got Sky, who's what we call King Dog because he's the oldest and the boss. He's a black fat cloat. Um, and he just sits back and watches from afar. Um, but yeah, we've got three pets at the moment, all beautiful. I'll get you some footage, guys, to have a look at. And Toby is uh, quite... Toby's got a little problem. We can't discuss it in front of him, I'm afraid, but he's nearly six months old, and two things haven't done what they should do without saying too much. Um, they haven't gone from where they were when he was born to where they should be when he's six months old. So we're having to monitor that quite closely because my vet's threatening to do nasty things to Toby if they don't do what they should do within the next few weeks or even maybe a month. So please have a little little prayer for Toby that things drop to where they should drop to imminently. Otherwise he's You're going to be- your dog live on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, my poor Toby. I don't want him to be de- blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Right, so Toby, yes, a little prayer for Toby would be nice, guys. Yeah. Uh, interesting enough, Bobby, uh, the, the two-year-old retriever, has actually got the nickname of Meteor Dog, uh, because in 
the, the office at Abbey and I work out, which is where we usually do these live streams, uh, most of the time when we're working, he'll come in and sit between us and spend the, the entire day, or certainly most of the day, uh, in there between us, just uh, wanting strokes all the time. Unfortunately, we're now out of there. We've moved right way up to the top of the centre because Simon is uh, isolating at the moment. But um, uh, we do miss that meaty dog. We do miss the meaty dog. If you offered him food, you know he'd come and join you wherever you were. He's a he's a glutton for food, Bobby. Just say food to Bobby, and he's he's he's, he's all over you. Yeah, so we'll get you some footage, guys. I'll, I'll I'll get Laurie some footage tomorrow, and we'll put a little bit out on our YouTube channel so you can see uh, Toby and Bobby playing because it is quite unique and quite lovely. <laughs> right. And he's, he's a lot bigger than when you were last seen him. So. Who, Bobby or Toby? Uh, Toby is nearly as big as Bobby already. It's scary. Yeah. We got Toby. Toby was five kilos when we got him, and we weighed him the other day, and he's 19.7 kilos. So he's putting on weight so fast, it's terrifying. <laughs> uh, so Scottish astronomer has asked, uh, do we need to rescue small hedgehogs that aren't young at this time of year? Um, I would say no, unless they're looking as if they're really hungry. I would tend, first instance, I'd put food out for them. I don't think we're going to get any more frost now or certainly any more sustained frost. Um, if it was very small, I would worry because if they've come out of hibernation and they've dropped down sort of two or three hundred grams, I would just support feed for the time being. But all these cases, any rescue we do, we discuss it so often here, every case is individual. You never know what you're going to do until you know that specific case because different things change. You can look at pictures, you can look at videos, you can discuss it, you can get a bit of a, a feel for what sort of condition the animal's in. Every rescue and every animal is different. So rule of thumb, probably wouldn't bring them in, probably just support feed them to see how they go. But you know, always ring us up, always ring us for advice. And especially this year with everything going on as it is, whatever you have in, it, providing it's not in mortal danger or it's not gonna be sort of in the middle of a road or something, give us a call first, ask our advice, because we don't want to take wildlife into the centre unless we really have to. I'd much rather leave it with its with its parents or, or out in the wild to be what it does, but you know, we can judge. We've been doing this for 40 years. We're quite good at gauging what needs to come in and what doesn't. So ring us for advice and we can give you a, a very good idea of what we need to do next. We are open 24-7, uh, 365 as well. So if anything just happens at four o'clock in the morning, just call our main helpline, it will redirect to uh, one of the mobiles, Simon and uh, Alice is one of mine, um, and we can try and do what we can to, to help out. My mobile's so, just gone off. <laughs> well, you never know, it might be a rescue call. Um, Say hello to me. Oh, okay, I've just had a text. Here we are. A text. Uh -oh. I had a PA work with me for years. She was very, 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 very lovely. And she also scares me to death, so I always say she's very, 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 very lovely. So we've got Susan Blissett and George, who was one of our rescues for a long time as well, now live in Canada, which is a place I quite like to visit, never have, but nobody's paid for me to go. And um, they said, say hello to me and Georgie now. So Susie and Georgie, as you would say to me, we love you. Um, we do love you. You're great people. And one day we will meet again. But there's a song about that, isn't it? We'll meet again. Don't know where, don't know when. Oh my God, that was high, Laurie. I'll have another drink. Now, so, interestingly enough, Simon, for a long time, has been petitioning to do Wildlife Aid the West musical. Oh, that'd be and great. That would be so uh, good, Wildlife Aid the Mu Wildlife Aid the West musical. It depends how uh, how tortured people want to be. I'll torture anyone, Laurie. You know that. You have first-hand experience of that. Uh, we are not species specific at all. If we suddenly ran out of space, which I must admit we've been close to but never have had to, A, we would do everything in our power to make more space, however temporary, um, but we would, whatever was outside the realms, it would be whatever it was. We are not species specific, I will never be. I think Susie just said, oh no, this is Lucy now. 
your phone should be on silent when you're for filming Naughty Naughty. <laughs> My phone was on silent. It bleeped at me, Lucy. You're too far away. You should be, Sean should be doing the rescues. You should be working here. And I've just been told I'm naughty, naughty by my ex-vet nurse. I think, uh, I think there should be some um, penalty for that one, Lucy Kells. Never mind. What was I talking about then? I was saying something. I forgot what I was saying now. Uh, whether we'll limit intake. Oh yeah, that's right. No, well, we haven't ever had to. We've been incredibly close um, in peak of the season before now but we've always managed to beg, borrow or steal something temporary, an enclosure or a cage or something um, so we could put it out. We've actually got, you know, some people around us here have got cages they use for certain things and we can sort of go and borrow that. So never yet has it happened. If it did happen, we would not be species specific. It would go in first come, first served. I'm going to say uh, nothing to that either. Your phone is definitely not on silent. It is on silent. Actually, it's not on silent, actually. I'm lying to you. I think I lied to everybody. It just bleeped me. I should have put it on silent, and I didn't. But it hasn't rung, at least, so let's not whinge too much. Wildlife comes first. People come second, Laurie. You know that. A <laughs> uh, question for you. Is there anything you've learned over the years about wildlife that you wish you'd known earlier? Oh, everything. I wish I'd known it all at the beginning. It would have made life easier. I would have been more competent. Um, Forty years on, I'm still incompetent. Before Laurie says it, I thought I'd say it. Um, no, I'd love to have learned it all, but you learn as you go along. And I think actually the learning teaches you in a better way. You, you pick up information and it, you can assimilate it and it makes a lot of difference. But yeah, to go into something like this on day one, knowing it all, would be an absolute dream, I suppose, to most people. Um, I've learned as I've gone along. I don't regret it. Um, it hasn't caused me any major injuries. I never really mucked anything up that I should have got right first time because it, you do it anyway. It's feel. I always say to about rescuers, you've either got the feel to be a rescuer or you haven't, and you know very quickly which people are going to be good at it and which people aren't. Um, it's just, a, I like to call it a gift. I think it's a gift that we have. And several of us at the centre have got it, and s some people haven't. Um, you've got to be insane, you've got to be mad, you've got to not ever want to earn any money in your entire life, you've got to be prepared to stay work, awake 24 hours a day. Um, yeah, insanity is one of the best, best qualifications to come into wildlife care with. But if you love it, if you've got a passion for it, do it, because you will never get anything more rewarding than doing the work we do. So that's what it's all about, guys. Passion. Nathaniel has asked, uh, do, they, do they need to go to university to do what we do? <laughs> oh God, I wouldn't have started if I had to go to university. Um, I would love to have been a vet. I would have had a great time. I'd have had a great five years learning to be a vet. Would never have passed any of the exams. I still think I would have been a great vet. But uh, yeah, I, don't, I wouldn't be here now if I had to go to university. To be honest, volunteers we take on, we're quite happy for them to have no experience because then we can teach them our way as opposed to the wrong way. So our way is always right because we're, we're know-it-alls. But yeah, you don't have to have any knowledge or any experience. Again, you have to have the passion and you have to have the feel and you'll know very quickly whether you're going to fit in or not. So, pass on, Laurie. <laughs> yeah, we actually have uh, volunteers from all walks of life, everyone from uh, people who sort of dropped out of school or anything like that, right the way, right the way up to sort of PhD holding lecturers. Uh, there's absolutely no prerequisites for anything. All you need is a love for animals and a willingness to learn, really. Uh, there you go. For once, we agree. Uh, Only once, so, never again. Anti Mabel One has asked Are volunteers still permitted here uh, to care for the animals during quarantine? During our, presumably she means our quarantine or our self isolation. Yeah, the lockdown. Um, we do have volunteers here. As I say, uh, said earlier on when we started, we were on skeleton staff because a lot of people have self-isolated. Um, we certainly don't want to have people here who, if they did get it, could be very seriously ill. So we're quite selective, not nastily against you, but because we don't want the responsibility of something going horribly wrong. But yes, we do take volunteers. We're not taking them at the moment because there's quite a long induction period and all that has to happen and you have to learn. So we've actually stopped inductions for the time being. But as soon as we're the other, out of lockdown and the other side, <coughs> we always need volunteers. We've got about 370 on our books at the moment, which only probably less than 100 are active because of the problems we've got.
but when we get out the other side of this onto the brave new world, which we hope we will, um, then obviously we'll be looking to induct more people into our way of life. So, um, so I was very surprised that uh, when we do release animals, they're often quite re uh, released in beautiful nature spots. Um, do we have a map with places that are suitable, or is it just we get what we give them? Um, we're very careful where we release. If we, if it's an adult creature providing it hasn't come from the middle of a town or something stupid we release back to where it was found because they know their territory and I think it's quite important for them to know where they're going to. Um, if it's a small town and it's an adult fox or something we actually do release but we release at night when it's quiet there's nothing on the road uh, but with young animals we do find what we hope are pretty idyllic spots for them to start a new life, a new world, second time out in the wild and have a great life, probably longer than it would have been if they um, had been in a town or something. So yeah, we're quite selective on our spots. We're very lucky. I mean, Surrey, however near to London it is, has a lot of woodland. It has a lot of beautiful areas to go in and we have a lot of uh, uh, members who are happy for animals to be released on their land. I mean, this year we are still looking for fox release sites. Um, we prefer it to be somewhere quite near us because we can't sort of travel them all over the country. So within about half an hour, three quarters of an hour from us. If you've got a beautiful bit of land, it's big enough, and you don't mind a temporary cage up on your land, please give us a call, because we often need to release, re release foxes, we need to release badgers, all sorts of things like that. So yes, good pieces of land are always helpful. Uh, a lot of the animals we deal with as well, certainly the, an the adult animals, uh, are very territorial. So they do need to go back to where they were found. So a lot of the release locations for those are actually dictated about where the animal was. Uh, so if it does come from a really, really nice area, it will go back to that really, really nice area. Unfortunately, if it does come from the middle of a, um, an industrial estate or something like that, it will have to go back there. They know where to find food, where to find shelter. They know their territorial boundaries. And it's vital that they do go back. Absolutely. Uh, I, one of our old live streams, we had him uh, as a guest with us. I thought we banned him, Laurie. I thought we banned him from any more contact. You, you will in a minute because he's asked, how do I cope with you? You're just so lucky to be able to have me to cope with, I can say, Richard. I mean, you couldn't be more lucky in your entire life. Having met me, your life, surely, young sir, has got to be complete. The only thing that really upsets me, he's the most tremendous wildlife artist and I couldn't even draw a stick man if I tried. Um, check out his website, he's a brilliant wildlife artist. At the moment, obviously, nobody's selling very much, doing very much, but he's drawing, I think he's drawing an elephant at the moment, which is pretty yeah, phenomenal. Yeah. Um, yeah, check out his website, give him a couple of orders, don't pay him too much, because we want all your donations to come to here, but, but, but just bung him the odd 50p, he'll be very grateful. <laughs> Um, we've talked about this, when we started WAF we were going to do domestic and wildlife, thank heavens we didn't because we'd just be drowned by now. Um, I think it's better to do what you do well, I mean we are to a degree expanding with WAF when we get the money, we've got this new centre or this new site which is 20 acres big, um, we're going to do far more education because I really think education and inspiring youngsters to understand not only to love wildlife, but why we need the wildlife and why we need the habitat around us. I think that's so vital, especially now, which has been proven in the last few weeks. You know, kids need to understand why wildlife needs to be there, why we need, here's my favorite word, Laurie, the food chain intact. Um, and, so, and so we're gonna, yeah, it will expand to a degree, but within the fields of what we do now, because I think I'd rather specialize in something and be damn good at it, than try to do a little bit of everything and not be very good at it. So. Yeah, if anybody wins the lottery over the next few weeks and wins a few million pounds, we need, believe it or not, about 10 million pounds to build this new centre. So although we're starting it this year, we're going to build the wetlands this year because they take years to actually mature and look lovely anyway. But the wetlands will be built. We have enough money in the bank to do that. Um, and that will be started probably in May and will be finished by about September. Then when we've done the wetlands, we have to plant all that up. And there's so much more work to be done. But you know, to do the big building, the big hospital building, the cages, the education centre, that will probably come in dribs and drabs unless anybody leaves us an, an absolute fortune. 
in which case I'll probably start Wildlife Aid Barbados Limited tomorrow. Joking, guys, just joking. <laughs> Uh, Jay has asked, what's the most common species we rehabilitate? Uh, oh. I suppose that really depends on the time of year, really, doesn't it? Yeah, it's the time of year. I mean, you get it's weird in, in an orphan season. You'll suddenly get a week of starlings or a week of something or a week of fox cubs or whatever. It's really weird how everything seems to get born in species together. Um, it, it, we get some, I mean, obviously garden birds, pigeons are very common. Foxes we get quite a lot of. So it really depends upon the time of year and we re rehabilitate more hopefully successfully, because that's what we're all about. Uh, so we're on the last couple of questions now, guys, because we are starting to wrap up in um, the next sort of five minutes or so. Um, it's past my bedtime, Laurie, nearly. <laughs> Sarah has said it's gotten dark in England. Yes, it has. Unfortunately, uh, there's, there's still a bit of light in the sky, but there's not that much. It is uh, 8.06 p.m. in England. Have we got a super moon? We had a super moon last night. It was spectacular. Yeah. Absolutely spectacular. Whether we've got... The, the remnants of a supermoon in the UK tonight, I don't know, but it was pretty spectacular last night. Yeah, a couple of people asking about my audio as well, so I'm actually uh, on the phone to Simon at the moment, um, and he has a phone on loudspeaker in his office. Uh, obviously we can't be near each other with social distancing rules and everything that's in place, um, so that's why I sound a little far away or a little sort of muffled, because it is unfortunately uh, coming out of the phone. Look, as we're getting to the end, Laurie, I'm going to just lift it. I know Laurie will probably get cross with me now, but you can see the, oh, the state of Simon's desk for a start. There, there's Laurie. He, Laurie's coming out of that one. Just wave, Laurie. Wave, Laurie. They won't see you, but it'll make you feel better. But look, this is the state of my desk. Look. It is. Yeah, I'm going to give them your personal number immediately. Look, there's just two of the... Co I've had about 15 cans of Coca-Cola today. Um, yeah, so I'm now going to put this back and it'll probably be at totally the wrong angle, but it might be enough to just wind the evening up, hopefully. Yeah, it's, it's at the wrong angle. Uh, so a couple more donations have come in. Push by Cam, who is, again, another regular on this channel. Uh, he's donated £10, has put, got him as most of his life. Keep up the good work, Simon. What animal do you fear the most? And don't say me. Or Alex. It's going to be Alice. It's got to be Alice that I fear most. I used to fear Susan Blissett a lot. Um, I never really feared Lucy. Unless she threatened to leave, then I feared her a lot. Um, animal I don't. I don't fear animals particularly. I have great respect for animals. I think if you're going to rescue any wild animal, um, you've got to have respect for it. You can't just go and think you can stroke it and get on well. I suppose fearsome-wise... A great, I, which we don't work with here. I did work with them on SOS with great white sharks. I wasn't, I can say honestly, I wasn't within my comfort zone with great white sharks. But you know, they all have their place. And it's again, here we go, my favourite word. It's all about the food chain. You need an apex predator to keep things down. That's why things went out of balance in the UK because we got rid of the lynx, we got rid of the wolf, all these sort of animals which kept deer populations down and other populations down. Nature has a great way of working. The only time when nature doesn't work is when man interferes with it. And perhaps we should leave it there, Laurie, because man uh, will hopefully this time learn his lesson through interfering and we'll start to get things right in the future. Yeah, um, just a couple more donations, thanks, just before we uh, go. Mostly staying, donated £10, and it's got guys, thank you so much for everything you do, so thank you very much for the support. Myra Kinghorn, who's actually one of our volunteers and helps us out massively with orphan feeding on the Rosen side. Um, she's put, sorry, she can't come in, but miss you all. We miss you too, Myra. Thank you uh, for all the help you're still giving us. And she's donated £10, which is incredible. Myra can't actually come in, Laurie, because she's so old. I mean, I know I shouldn't say that on air, but Myra's old. That's why they've locked me in my office, because I'm old. I mean, it's quite sad, us oldies together, but there we are. Uh, Annalee B has donated twenty ninety nine in Canadian dollars, so thank you very much. There's no comment on that one. Uh, if you did put on one, unfortunately, it hasn't come through. But uh, I'm just saying bye as well to Angela Warren in the chat, who's one of our volunteers and is currently caring for a large number of baby rabbits. So if any of you have seen the video that we put out recently about baby rabbits, it's actually Angela that is caring for those and sort of getting them through. So uh, she's having quite a few sleepless nights. That's it. Laurie's gone quiet now because it is now. It's right. 2010. We've had our 10 minutes of drinking up time um, and it's about time we went. Guys, as always, thank you for being with us. 
please spread the word about our work please spread the word for donations legacies whatever because you know the more it sounds it just sounds money orientated but the more money you give us the more work we can do to help british wildlife so it's about british wildlife really but it's all sadly um functions because of the money we get look at the shop look at the amazon wish list support us help us but we just thank you because without you we couldn't do this and just remember do your eye dot self-isolate and stay safe and nhs people thank you yeah uh, and you actually you can't see the chat at the moment Simon, but we're getting so many well wishes and thank yous um stay safe so thank you to each and every one of you and stay safe yourself uh, and i'll let you have the last word on this one time he never lets me have the last word. That I gave such a beautiful sign off. I did the clap. That was the time to send the screen to black. What a perfect ending. But no, Encyclopedia hits back, does another sentence, which makes my sign off much less. So all I'm going to do again before Laurie puts the screen to black is... <laughs>